Hi, everyone. My name's Tom Hume. I'm a product manager in Google Research. I'm here today with my colleagues Scott and Saga to talk about the intersection of machine learning and accessibility. So around the world, 1 billion people currently experience some form of disability, which means that people with disabilities are using your app right now and in larger numbers than you might expect. Thanks to advances in machine learning, today we can help people in ways that just weren't possible a few years ago. So today we'll show you a few examples of this help, tell you how we're thinking about accessibility and machine learning, and give you a few hints for how you might apply it in your own apps. And as it happens, I'm the product manager for Voice Access, so let's start there. What's Voice Access? It's an Android app that lets you control your phone using your voice. We designed it for and with people with manual dexterity challenges, but we think it would benefit everyone who wants a hands-free experience. Once you've downloaded Voice Access from the Play Store and set it up, you can give your phone simple commands. Commands like open maps, search for Stinson Beach, tap directions. We launched a big redesign of Voice Access last year with a huge set of improvements. We rethought the user interface, we added some new capabilities, but today, I'd like to talk to you about how we use machine learning to make voice access easier and faster. So let's step back for a second and remind ourselves how accessibility works on Android. When you're writing an app, all the different components of your user interface have some text associated with them. This text is used in different ways. A screen reader for the blind might read it out. Voice access uses it to provide labels on screen and to understand commands. If you're using a good user interface toolkit, this text and some other important information is automatically set up. But for some elements, like photos and icons, developers need to add the labels themselves. And I'm sad to say that many developers don't add these labels or use toolkits that don't support accessibility well, which means that important parts of their apps are just invisible to their users. There have been some studies into this. If you Google inaccessible button disease, you'll find a good one. And sometimes, even when developers put in the work, they focus on screen readers. And text that works there isn't so good for voice access. But what if voice access could look at images on screen in the same way a sighted person would, recognize icons, and give them labels? Well, this would have two benefits. Firstly, where an app developer hasn't given an icon a label, voice access could add one. But also, it would mean that users could refer to the same icon with the same name consistently across apps. A classic three-dot overflow icon, for instance, might be labeled menu by some apps, overflow or options by others. Now, all these apps are trying to do the right thing by their users, but we shouldn't expect users to learn different names for the same icon in different apps. So that's exactly what we did. Android R added a new screenshot API for accessibility services to use. Voice Access uses this new API to take a screenshot and passes that screenshot into a machine learning model we call IconNet. IconNet gives precise information about which icons are on screen and where, giving them labels. And then Voice Access takes those labels, plus the ones an app has provided, and uses them. And here's my favorite part. It does all of this locally, without your screen ever leaving your Android device. We think this is a great use for machine learning, to fill in some of the gaps in Android apps for users with accessibility needs, and to do so quickly and privately. Voice Access detected about 30 icons when we launched. We added another 40 in February, and there's more intelligence to come. So I'll end with a plea to developers. Please download Voice Access from the Play Store and use it to test your applications. There are literally millions of people worldwide who have manual dexterity issues. Voice access gives them full use of their Android device and your apps. Testing your app with voice access is good for these people and it's good for you. You can download it at g.co slash voice access. And now my colleague Scott is going to talk to you about Lookout. Scott. Thanks, Tom. I'm Scott Adams and I work in research as the product manager on Lookout. And I'm here to talk to you about a case study and ML applications for people with visual impairments. Lookout is an app that uses the smartphone's camera to recognize objects and text for users who are blind or low vision. We use some cool technology that's available to you through MLKit APIs, but there's more to it than connecting a camera to a classifier. Especially in accessibility, it's critical to design with your users and not just for them. There are two questions to ask. One, how well do I understand what the user needs? And two, how can I fit the technology to those needs? At Google, this is codified in our AI principles, such as be socially responsible and be built and tested for safety. For example, Lookout went through proactive adversarial testing to guard against unfair bias. 
This kind of sophisticated evaluation is critical, but the path is much easier if you build with your users from the very beginning. For instance, Lookout uses several different image classifiers. Here's how we used user feedback to tune for precision and recall. As a refresher, imagine we have a mix of apples and oranges and an apple detector. If we have a high precision apple detector, then the detector is taking no chances. It's only going to say apple if it's certain I have an apple in my hand. On the negative side, if I have an apple that's, let's say, oddly shaped or a different color than usual, it's going to say nothing. So we'll have false negatives where I do have an apple in my hand, but the detector is silent. Contrast that with high recall. In this case, the detector may be so sensitive that anything that is round and about the size of my hand is an apple. So every time I show it an apple, it's saying apple every time. That's terrific. But the downside is I might show it an orange and it's going to say apple. And that's a false positive where it's saying apple, but there is no apple in my hand. And ideally, we have both high precision and high recall, but that's often not possible. So how do we tune that? Well, it may come down to the user. If I really prefer an apple to an orange, I may prefer a high precision detector. So with that in mind, here's what we learned from our users on Lookout. I'll talk about two cases, one on currency and one on objects. So for currency, some types like US dollars are the same size, color, and texture regardless of their value, which makes it impossible to distinguish a $1 bill from a $100 bill if I can't see the bill. So our goal is to identify the value of the bill. Now for objects, imagine that I can't see and I'm going into a room that I'm unfamiliar with. I might want to know what's in that room, what kind of furniture, so I can understand what kind of room it is, like a living room versus an office. So with that in mind, what did users tell us? For currency, it was fairly intuitive. They said, listen, never confuse a $1 bill for a $100 bill. Don't guess, if you're not certain, say nothing. So in this case, this is a pretty clear signal for precision. Now, the easy thing to do is at first glance, take that lesson and carry it over to objects. But there's some nuance here. Imagine we have an object and it could be an armchair or it could be a couch. If we're very high precision, we may say neither because we're not sure. And from users, we learn that actually either answer has some value even if it's imprecise. So whether it's an armchair or it's a couch, I know that this is a pretty big object and this room might be a living room. So we actually want to balance between the two here. So taking a big step back, Getting this kind of user feedback throughout development is critical. Do it during design, during development, during testing, not after release. It takes longer, but you make a better product. OK, if you're excited to start writing your own accessibility apps with computer vision, then dive into MLKit. We have barcode scanning, OCR, and object detection. And if you or someone you know is bundled with vision, please consider Lookout. Next, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Sagar. Hi, I'm Sagar. I work in machine perception team in Google Research. My team's mission is to help machines understand the world like humans do. We work on live transcribe and sound notifications. Live transcribe is an app for deaf and hard of hearing people to get captions for real-time conversations in over 80 different languages. Live transcribe is a great example of using ML technologies together with good UX research to provide meaningful experiences. It uses automatic speech recognition, of course, as well as models to detect speech versus other audio, and also a sound event detection model to provide sound chips to the user. I want to share the story of how Live Transcribe came about. Meet Dimitri. He's a computer science researcher who has been working on speech recognition for over three decades. Dimitri typically relied on lip reading and a professional captioner for communications. As good as he is with lip reading, we would often struggle to have impromptu conversations around the water cooler. Lip reading alone is only about 50% accurate and professional captioners are not always present. As ASR technology improved and became more pervasive, Dimitri launched an experiment with the team to create an app for real-time captioning. That Android app uses Google's Cloud Speech to Text API to turn that water cooler chat into captions on the screen of his phone. Together with Dimitri's decades of experience in speech technology, the team iterated on the app and improved it to a point where he started using it daily for personal and professional conversations. Dimitri was excited to try more things in the app. Motivated by his insights, as well as enthusiasm, we started looking at what else we could do to make the app better. What if the app could interpret more than just spoken conversation? 
A few years ago, we released a dataset called AudioSet, which allows developers to recognize over 600 different sound event classes in their applications. The easiest way to get started with AudioSet is to start with a pre-trained model from that dataset. For that, you can directly integrate our open source pre-trained model called YAMNet to understand different sound events. Here is a use case demonstrating how critical this non-speech information can be. Dimitri recalls a story of how one day he was asleep and the smoke alarm was active. He could not hear it, but luckily his neighbor came in and woke him up. As our researchers talked to more potential users, we heard countless stories like this. And this led us to use haptic alerts, vibrations delivered to your smartwatch, to notify users about important sounds in their home. So a few months ago, we launched sound notifications. It tells you when it hears sounds around your home, like sirens, dog barking, babies crying, water running, or if somebody knocks on your door. We also open source Live Transcribe's Android App Engine, so developers can customize it for their own use cases by integrating it within a bigger existing app or porting it to other platforms. Another such experiment of using ML for accessibility is Project Shuba. Shuba, which means sign language in Japanese, is a project centered around sign language detection and understanding. Together with the Nippon Foundation and the Chinese University of Hong Kong, we created a web game for people to learn a bit of Japanese and Hong Kong Sign Languages. And since there are over 150 different sign languages in the world, including American Sign Language, Indian Sign Language, and many, many more, to better help developers create their own gesture and sign language understanding systems, we have open sourced a gesture detection toolkit for developers. You can check out demos of Project Shuba at the IO Sandbox. Thank you for watching. Just like Dimitri and our team's prototype Live Transcribe and its extensions, with many existing bits and pieces, we welcome developers to experiment with such different machine learning technologies to help the world become more accessible. Please reach out if you'd like to learn more.